sermon for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, and as we very occasionally do, we will be departing from the lectionary in order to explore what I consider a few key verses. Our text this morning is derived from the Acts of the Apostles, the ninth chapter, beginning with the second half of the 19th verse. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, in order to put this passage into context, we need to consider a little of Saul's personal history prior to this event. Acts first introduces us to Saul at the end of chapter 7, during the stoning of St. Stephen. Then they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said that, he fell asleep. So while the man who will come to be known as Saint Stephen is dying, and yet, almost as a type of Christ, is asking God to forgive his murderers, it seems there is a group of onlookers, uh, among them Saul, who is being honored. At first, it's almost a non sequitur. The authors of Acts are busy describing the terrible way that Stephen died, and all of a sudden, they jump to a side scene where witnesses are throwing their outer clothes down before a young man. Now, a little light is shed upon the scene in the very beginning of the 8th chapter. We are told that Saul approved of this lynch mob stoning Stephen. It seems that Saul was somehow important. Important enough that he would be held in enough high esteem that his companions should honor him by casting their clothes before him much, by the way, as the people of Jerusalem cast their clothes before Jesus as he entered the city riding on a donkey. For that was the custom of the day, to honor some great personage, very often a military hero, by throwing your cloak or other outer garment on the road before them. So it's obvious to us that Saul is, at this point, highly revered, a hero, at least to some of the Jews, and he stands there as Stephen is dying, somehow letting the witnesses know that he believes this is a very good thing. One possible explanation for this. Saul, at this juncture in his life, is likely what we would refer to as a zealot. Now, the zealots were a faction of Judaism that advocated armed rebellion against the overseeing government of Rome. The stoning of Stephen was no orderly execution. In fact, you might recall that the Jews had no real right to oppose capital punishment at all. What happened to Stephen is that he made his lengthy speech before the ruling elders in uh, chapter 7, uh, a history lesson, really. And as he did this, the elders became enraged. And by the time he finally told them that he saw the Son of Man next to God, they, as the expression goes, lost it. Stephen was killed by a group of high-powered clerics and religious officials that had turned into a bloody lynch mob. People who usually occupy their time by arguing the finer points of the law 
were here driven to a complete frenzy of violence. And most likely, nothing would have made this young Saul happier. At least, these old gray hairs are capable of some action, he might have thought. They actually can do something after all. Uh, maybe there is hope for us. So that's Saul. His heart, his very spirit, burns for the way it ought to be. He wants to see Israel restored to independence, and he wants his religion purified. And in his heart, violence is a perfectly acceptable means to both ends. Now you're probably aware of what happens shortly after this. We encounter Saul again in chapter 8, verse 3. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Of course, then everything changes in chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the voice responded, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul is then led to the city where he meets Ananias. We are told that Ananias had a conversation, as it were, with God about Saul. And at first, Ananias wasn't too impressed. Isn't this the guy who's been our bitter and decidedly dangerous enemy? But in the end, Ananias is faithful and greets Saul as a brother, despite everything that has transpired. Now, by the middle of chapter 9, Saul is preaching the gospel with extraordinary power. Before we get into our main theme, I want to point out something that may be obvious to you, but nonetheless worth, I think, saying. In the so-called conversion of Saul, Three days of prayer, as we are told in Acts 9, three days of coming out of the death of his old, violent understanding to emerge into the new life of the gospel. We have here an amazing example of God's justice and mercy, which here, as always, seem to join so elegantly, so perfectly, and so seamlessly. Saul is a sinner. The worst kind of sinner, perhaps. He is violent, and we might believe proud of it. And he does all of this in the name of God. And God convicts him. God calls him on it. Why are you persecuting me? Me, Jesus. And Saul is brought to his knees immediately. God then pronounces judgment. And as always, judgment is mercy. Saul is convicted and converted. He is redeemed dramatically. Everything he had been seems to have been swept away, and he is introduced into the new creation. If ever there was a man, to paraphrase John Donne, battered by God, ravished by God, it was Saul. If we were to keep reading in Acts, we would see that immediately Saul becomes a target of his former allies, and many Christians have a tough time believing the sincerity of his conversion. And that's a lot like us, isn't it? We might say, people don't really change, do they? After all, once a liar, always a liar. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Once a criminal or a con man, always the same, no? Someone commits a crime, and they are sentenced, and they do their time, pay their debt to society, as the expression goes, 
but are the scales really balanced after they are released from prison? Once I sat in a Salvation Army citadel talking to an old man who told me that he had killed four men in his life. And now at that space and time, it was easy to speak the words of forgiveness to this fellow and maybe even believe those words as I said them. After all, he was old and looked and seemed entirely harmless, and he had been out of prison for many years. And most of all, he claimed he had been converted to following Christ more than a decade ago. But nonetheless, did I really trust him? If he had needed a job and I were in such a position, would I have hired him? Would I have let him babysit my children, for example? Would I want this man as an elder in my church or as a Eucharistic minister? Would I want him as a volunteer to help count the offerings? The difference we can immediately see between God's forgiveness and man's is that the forgiveness God gives is immediate and unconditional, whereas we humans, well, we are one to invent phrases like, oh, maybe I can forgive, but I will never forget. And in so doing, we belie so much of what we say we believe about God and God's position in our lives and the high calling to which he calls us. So then, all the more extraordinary that Saul does this sudden and complete about-face. We are told that Saul, uh, preaching in power, sets about proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Imagine proving it. That phrase struck me. How many modern-day evangelists might long for that singular ability to prove that Jesus is the Christ. Of course, Acts 9 doesn't tell us how Saul did this, but we might safely assume that he did it in the same way that is spoken of in Acts 17.3 and Acts 18.28. He used the Hebrew scriptures to prove the authentic messiahship of Jesus, pointing out passages that were deemed to be messianic prophecies and showing how Jesus fit those prophecies perfectly. And that makes sense, of course. For all Saul, later Paul's hardships, he did in this case have, it would seem, a comparatively easy task, at least among those of a pharisaical mindset. They trusted that the scriptures were on some level God's message to them, and they were looking for a Messiah. They were steeped in the language of Messiah, so to speak. And so it might be easy in the same way for us to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, if we lived in a world or among people who trusted the book we refer to as the Bible as authoritative. Look, see, it says right here, Jesus is the Christ. But then again, we are in fact already doing a lot of that among ourselves, among believers, among those who look to Scripture with every sermon and every Bible study and discussion. Are we not refining our understanding of Christ and his Abba and who we are in relation to both. But what of the so-called outside world? What of those who have moved past what we think of as Holy Scripture as being the definitive authority in their lives? What of those who might perhaps admire the Bible as a wonderful collection of antique literature, but as the Word of God? Really? What of those, and there are many, who completely reject the Bible as being a book so full of violence and completely illogical premises? Or 
What are those who have never bothered to read it at all? Because they believe it has no relevance, or will simply bore them to tears? Or what are those individuals who may read scripture, but have such strongly ingrained cultural notions about what it means that they will never see it our way? For any such individuals, it is highly unlikely that any amount of pointing out of relevant scriptural passages will make much of a difference. If, if we believe that teaching Christ, proving Christ, if you will, is important, we must do it in some other way. I should point out at this juncture, we may be at a theological impasse. Now, if one's understanding of proving Christ is tantamount to getting individuals to make a faith statement, something like, I confess Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, in order that they may know they are saved from some sort of eternal punishment, then in fact the rest of what I have to say may not be for you. If one is of the mind that God has already chosen some people to be moved by the reading of Scripture to receive Christ, and those are the ones who will be saved, and others are equally predestined to not accept, and thus will be condemned, or perhaps remain in their condemnation, then probably what I am about to say will make no sense, although I hope you will continue to listen. On the other hand, if one senses that learning about Christ so as to be possible to follow what the early disciples simply called the way is valid and meaningful, if you have a sense that the eternal, boundless life of which Jesus speaks is something more immediately vital than simply being saved from an afterlife of punishment, then possibly this might make sense. The way in which we may prove that Christ is the Messiah is to live into Christ, is as individuals and as a body of believers to demonstrate with who and what we are the validity of the way. Here I might cite virtually countless passages that speak of followers of Christ learning to become as he is, but my favorite, and some of the clearest, I believe, come from Ephesians 4, from the first verse onwards. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of us all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. And continuing the 11th verse, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ might be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And on to the 15th verse. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And in this way, we will show the world, demonstrate to the world, Christ more powerfully than any words can do. So now you may say to yourself, but pastor, we are but human. We are all flawed and sinful. And I might respond to you, yes, and I am too. Perhaps I am even more so than many of you listening to this. And that is all the more reason 
for us to desire the way of Christ. And being sinful, we know where to begin with what is perhaps the single most Christ-like of actions, perhaps the greatest demonstration of agape, to forgive. And who better to forgive than those who have been in need of forgiveness? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, knowing they too were flawed and sinful. Here is the power to end the damnation of conflict, personal and societal and even global. Here is the power to transform the world when we recognize that each of us has had a hand in the creation of the hell of violence and hatred. When we realize that each of us on some level, like Saul so many years ago, has blood on our hands. When we realize that that fact did not stop God from calling Saul and transforming him. And it did not stop Saul, once having been introduced to Christ, from becoming a most powerful part of Christ's body, even though he continued to recognize his shortcomings. Chief of sinners, he called himself, surely right up until the end. In your life this week, you have the ability to prove Christ to someone by forgiving when forgiveness is not deserved. Perhaps even when the need for forgiveness is not realized. Every time, in fact, you choose the kind word over the harsh, the loving action over the selfish one, you're proving that Christ remains alive in our world, and his way will in the end bring about an end to all ill, all hatred, and all suffering. In the end, love will win, and you, brothers and sisters, have the capacity to begin to prove that today. Thank you.